As I said earlier, we were going to have a team from Trinity Bible College come here and share with us today some music and testimonies and that due to weather concerns and roads uh, that fell through at the last minute. So we are still going to enjoy our time together. And I said, okay, Lord, now what do you want me to share? <laughs> so here we are today. Um, I'm going to start with this before I get too far down. I have to read this because it fits today. Today is Fall Back to Church Sunday. We're not streaming it live. We're encouraging everybody to come. There was a, a guy who saw two men working for the public works department. One would dig a hole and the other would fall, find, would fall behind him and fill the hole in. The person thought, that's kind of strange. So he thought, I'm going to ask him what's going on. So he said to the first person, why do you dig a hole only to have your partner follow behind and fill it up again? The guy who was digging the hole wiped his brow and he sighed, well, I suppose it. It probably looks odd because we're normally a three-person team, but today the lad who plants the trees called in sick. So when you're not here, you're missed. Yes, when you're not here, you are missed. We don't want to see that take place. Today we are encouraging you to be a part of the, the house of the Lord today, and that's what I want to share with you um, from the Word of God the importance of the house of the Lord. Um, if you have notes, you can fill in. I have notes up above as well. You can follow along. I've also got a special video we're going to show towards the end of the, the missions team from Pebble Creek in, in Missouri that came earlier. They put together a missions video, and they sent, me, um, they sent it to me, and I want to share that with you. But um, before we get started... Uh, can we pray? Heavenly Father, we have dedicated this house to you. And many of us today have dedicated our lives to you. And we ask today, Lord, that whatever you have for us, Lord, that our hearts would be open and that we would receive what you have to speak to us today. May you be glorified today, Jesus, we pray in your name. Amen. Psalm 122.1 is an interesting verse. Here's what it says. I rejoiced with those who said to me, let us go to the house of the Lord. I rejoiced with those who said to me, let us go to the house of the Lord. There used to be a song when I was growing up. It went like this. Some of you might know it. Let us go, let us go, let us go. Let us go into the house of the Lord. Anybody here remember that song besides me? Like maybe one hand or two? <laughs> okay. There's something special about the house of the Lord. It's a place to meet God in his presence. It's a place to meet other brothers and sisters in Christ. And it's a place to accomplish the purposes of God. Today is a day that I feel like we need to celebrate the things those things together in person with real live people. To me, that's exciting. I like to see your face in person as opposed to through a screen. How many of you can agree with that? It's a lot better to see somebody in person. Yes. There is a commercial out there. Some of you know this. It says, what has Brown done for you? UPS, that's their commercial. Well, how about we ask this question? What has the church done for you? What has the church done for you? Let me just describe to you what the church is. There are two definitions of the church that you'll find in Scripture. The first definition of the church is what I call the capital C Christian church. What do I mean by capital C? That is every individual in the world alive that calls themselves Christians. That's the church. That's every believer. That's every follower of Jesus Christ. There is also another church, what I call the little c church. That is believers in an area that meet together and worship together, usually in a building or some sort of a place because they are the little c church. Harleton Faith Chapel would be considered one of those places. They usually meet in, in, in buildings and 
and they do activities together, and they have relationships with one another. Today we are celebrating that. Just as the Jewish people met in the temple or the synagogues in Jesus' time, in the New Testament church met in houses and later in church buildings, we meet at 601 Northwest Pritchard Street. That's the address of this building. That's where we meet. There is, this is what we would consider our house of the Lord. And we rejoice with those who go there. I rejoice when I see you. By the way, if you don't show up to church, I miss you. I don't always call or say things. But there's a sense when people are gone that we miss them. So let's re rejoice together, shall we? Let's start with this first idea. And then at the end of each section, here's what I want you to think about. I want you to give you an opportunity, a very short a chance to share of some things that you have experienced in each of these areas. So let's first talk about why it's important to go to the house of the Lord. The presence of God shows up in a special way here. God's people throughout time have celebrated in the house of the Lord, and that looked different throughout time. Psalm 26, 8 says, I love the house where you live, O Lord, the place where your glory dwells. Let me give you some examples of what the house of the Lord looked, has looked at throughout the Bible times. First, it was something we call the tabernacle in the wilderness. That was a place where the people met God. Exodus 35, 13 talks about uh, some of the tabernacle. And it, there was actually in the tabernacle, there was a couple of interesting articles there. They had a place called the table of the presence. And they also had the bread of the presence. And those were inside the tabernacle to represent that God's presence was there. There's something special when they went into that house of the Lord to experience the presence of the Lord. That's almost like a foresight of what we begin to see later on in Scripture. And then later on we see God had them build the temple in Jerusalem. That was another place to meet God, where his presence would dwell. 1 Kings chapter 8 says, When the with priests withdrew from the holy place, the cloud filled the temple of the Lord. And the priests could not perform their service because of the cloud, for the glory of the Lord filled his temple. Can you imagine that the presence of God was so strong, so thick, so there, that the priests themselves could not even stand in the presence of God. There is something special about the house of the Lord where God's presence dwells. After the temple in Jerusalem, we find even in Jesus' time, we find that the Jewish people would come to the temple on a special occasion, but they also met in synagogues in their local, th their local towns, their local municipalities, wherever they lived. In fact, it says in the book of Luke, chapter 4, verse 16, Jesus went to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, and on the Sabbath day he went into the synagogue, as was his custom. Jesus spent every Sabbath in the synagogue where the presence of God showed up, where they learned, where they grew. And if we look at the church in the New Testament, we see that they even expanded that to where they met together in homes and eventually met together in buildings, which we call churches today. Acts 27, on the first day of the week, we came together to break bread. They met together in a place. Sometimes when we meet together in a place with other Christians, the presence of God just shows up in a special way. How many of you can say you've been in a place where there's other believers, like a church building, like Harleton Faith Chapel, and there was just something different about the presence of God that showed up there? Amen? I have, expre I have felt that before. By the way, the Bible teaches us the Holy Spirit resides in us, so his presence goes with us wherever we go. But there is something about 
what I call the manifest presence. That's what we feel, what we see, what we experience that can show up in powerful and amazing in, in, in ways that express and show the glory of God. That's what the house of the Lord becomes for many of us. We consecrate. Uh, now, I wasn't here when this building was, was, um, was built. I wasn't here when it was remodeled. But I've read some of the history, and I know that the people here and some of the pastors and the people who are part of this church consecrated this building. They set it apart saying this is going to be used for the Lord's work. Am I right? Those of you who were here? Yes. They consecrated. They said this is going to be a house where we do things for the Lord, much like the temple was in the Old Testament or the tabernacle. And here's what I believe. God honors that when we dedicate a building to him. There's something special about meeting here in this building or any other building that's consecrated to the Lord. So here's what I want you to think about today for a second. And it doesn't have to be long, but what are some special memories or experiences that you have had with the presence of God in this place? Does anybody want to share experience or a time or a generic event maybe that you had where the presence of God felt like, oh, it's here. Does anybody have a thought when it comes to that? Maybe it was at an altar. Maybe it was, so I'm going to give you a second to think about that. When was a time when you were here in this place and the presence of God just showed up? I know I'm putting you on the spot. have been 10 years ago. Let me ask this. How many of you, when we sing worship songs, when we do the music part, quite regularly recognize and feel the presence of God? Raise your hand if you, that's you. You see, there's one right there. There's something different about when you show up and worship together that the presence of God comes into a place. Can you think of any other times when the presence of God has just been here? It was almost like the presence of God showed up in a special way as you dedicated that. That's good. Yes. How about in this place, has anybody, when somebody prayed for you, you felt like God just showed up? The presence of God was there in your circumstances, in your life. Nod your head, shake your head, and say, yes, that was. Here's what I want you to understand today. The house of the Lord is important because the presence of God sometimes shows up in a mighty way here in this place. 
I can, I can think back, and some of you are probably thinking back to mission services. You're thinking back to evangelists that were here. You're thinking back to on a Sunday morning, just nothing special was going on, and God just showed up. You're thinking back to when you were on a worship team, and all of a sudden, God just showed up. His presence was here. Why am I, why am I getting you to think that way? Because... The presence of the Lord, there's something special and different about being together that God shows up sometimes that you can't even get at home. God does show up, but there's something about being in the house of the Lord. I was glad when they said, let us go to the house of the Lord. The presence of the Lord is, can be awesome in those times. Acts 2.28 says, you have made known to me the paths of life. You will fill me with joy in your presence. Here's the other thing that takes place when it comes to the presence of God. Sometimes you're all dry and you come into a place like this and somebody else is carrying the presence of God with them and that affects your life for the positive because it's almost like they rub off on you and you get to experience through them the presence of God. There's a song out there by a guy named Phil Wickham. I won't play it for you, but I'll just do a little part of it. It goes like this. There's joy in the house of the Lord. There's joy in the house of the Lord today. We won't be quiet. We shout your praise. How many of you heard that song before? Anybody? There's joy in the house of the Lord today where the presence of God is. There's another song that that we sing sometimes, it goes like this. I love, I love, I love your presence. I love, I love, I love your presence. And I love, I love, I love you, Jesus. I love, I love. I love your presence. You see, when we get together and we sing songs like that, there's something special about the presence of God that shows up. There's another one song we sing. It goes like this. Holy Spirit, you are welcome here. Come flood this place and fill the atmosphere. Your glory, God, is what our hearts long for, to be overcome by your presence, Lord. There's something about being in the house of the Lord and worshiping together that the presence of God is special. I've even heard this. I've heard people that watch online say, it's different when I show up in person, the presence of God is felt differently. And I believe that. The presence of God in the house of the Lord is special. Let me talk about a second thing that's special about the house of the Lord. The people of God are here for each other. You're not alone. The church is, according to God himself, a family. Did you know that? We call each other brothers and sisters in Christ in the scripture. It's a bond that goes beyond DNA blood. It's a bond through the blood of Jesus who died for our sins. It's, here's the crazy thing about it. The family that you have in the house of the Lord is an eternal family. It will go with you into eternity. Did you know that? It will last longer than your blood relatives. One of the greatest aspects of this family that we call the church family is that we get the privilege as a church of being there for one another, even more than a blood family. Matter of fact, I have known many people that have said, my church family is closer than my blood family. Because God designed us to be a family and to be there for each other. Here's some things we get to do as the house of the Lord, the church. We get to pray for each other. 
We get to pray for each other. Listen to some of these verses. James 5, 16. Therefore, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous man is powerful and effective. How many of you are thankful that when you need prayer, that there is a church family that can pray for you? And they're effective. I know times in my life where I have gone through things and I can't even pray for myself, but people can pray for me. And they are there for me. That is a, that is a, a benefit. That is a great thing. Ephesians 6.18 says, that Pray in the Spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. And then it says, With this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for all the saints. Bible saying we are praying for another all the time. We should be praying for one another. James 5.14 says, Is any of you sick? He should call the elders of the church to pray over him and anoint him with oil in the name of the Lord. It is our opportunity, it is our privilege to pray for one another. The people of the Lord are there for one another. Here's another thing we get to do. We get to spend time together regularly. At least we're supposed to. Acts chapter 2, verses 46 and 47 talks about the early church after the day of Pentecost. You know what it says they did? Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. They broke bread in their... Now, they didn't just literally say, hey, everybody, who's got a bre- loaf of bread today? Let's just break some bread together like breaking bricks. No. What it means is they ate together. They had meals together. They enjoyed. That's why I love, we probably don't do it enough. I love potluck meals because we can sit around a meal together. Some of you are like, I hate potluck meals, but I love potluck meals. <laughs> because we can break bread together. There's something about food that we sit and converse around food that's important about spending time together. The church spent time together in the Bible. Here's another thing that they do to help each other. They help each other through tough times. How many of you have never been through tough times in your life? Raise your hand. I don't see any hands raised because that's not true. We all go through tough times. Listen to what the Bible says in Galatians chapter 6. Carry each other's burdens and then this way you will fulfill the law of Christ. You know, it's actually our privilege when you are going through things that we can pray with you, we can help you, we can lift your burdens from you. Hebrews 10.25, we quote this all the time when we talk about coming to church. But here's, here's why we come to church together. It says, let us not give up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but let us encourage one another and all the more as you see the day approaching. That means this. Things are going to get worse the closer we get to Jesus' return. Did you know that? So what do we need? We need each other. We need to encourage one another. There are some days when you just need somebody to encourage you. I had one of those weeks a couple weeks ago. Just one of those weeks that you just you just want to throw your hands in the air, right? And I remember just crying out to God. And you know what God did? He sent like three people my way to encourage me. People in the body of Christ. And I was like, thank you, Jesus. I really needed that. We're there for each other when we go through tough times. And here's another thing that we can do for each other, the people of God. They keep each other on the right path. What do I mean by that? Here's what it says in James chapter 5. My brothers, if any of you should wander from the truth and someone should bring him back, remember this, whoever turns a sinner from the error of his ways will save him him from death and cover over a multitude of sins. Galatians 6.1 says it this way, Brothers, if someone is caught in a sin, you who are spiritual should restore him gently, but watch yourself or you may also be tempted. You know what? All of us stumble in different ways. All of us struggle at times. It's great when somebody can say, you know what? I see you're going through it. I see you're heading down the right path. I want to let you know that I'm concerned about you. I'm praying for you. I'm helping you. You're, if you keep following down that path, you're going to get in a bad way. We keep each other on the right path. We encourage people. 
I don't know if anybody's ever told you this, but some people say, you know, when you become a Christian, your life is going to be grand and so much easy. Hogwash. That's not true. Here's what it is. When you become a Christian, your life is still hard but you have Jesus to walk you with, with you. You have people who are called the family of God to walk with you with, through it. You have a, a support system that you don't have in the world. It's important that we have the people of God to keep us on the right path. So I want you to think about this for a second. Here's the second question. What are some times that people in this church have been there for you? What things have they done for you? You don't have to be specific, but maybe you were going through a time and you needed somebody. I'll give you an example how I was discouraged and God sent several people to encourage me. Can somebody think of a time where the people of God were there for them? And you would share quickly. awesome. Somebody was there for you. I probably didn't even know that till you just said that. <laughs> now you're going to make me cry. <laughs> yes. Mm -hmm. I would love to hear your, one of your poems. When God shares poems with me, it's usually something that has happened in my life, something that's touched me, and then he will refer that to something in scripture or something that he wants to relay back to me. So th that's what this is. Um, I fell a while back. Oh, it was probably, I don't even know. But I really got hurt, and it was hard to move around for me, and I couldn't do the normal things I normally do. And that's what the start of this is about. So, My body was walking in unity. Each part helped me stand tall. But with a moment of unbalance, the ice laughed as it broke my fall. The things I did so easily were now more difficult to do. My everyday routine would be on hold for a month or two. God showed me that this can be true for not just me, but his body too. Ephesians says he knitted us together by each supporting part. Like the ice, Satan laughs when he's able to tear us apart. When we as mature and important body parts separate ourselves, it breaks the Savior's heart. His word says his body is to reach out to the lost. But when the body loses heart, the unsaved suffer the cost. We need to walk in unity, each part helping us stand tall. We need, we need each arm, hand, and leg with Christ being the head of all. We should just pray and go home because that's better than anything I could have said. <laughs> no. There's a song that used to go like this. I'm so glad I'm a part of the family of God. I've been washed in the fountain, cleansed by his blood joint heirs with Jesus as we travel this sod. I'm a part of the family, family of God. I don't know about you, but coming to a group of people that have your back, that care about you, that love you, there's something special. 
Let me finish my last part of my message, and that is we are there for each other. The people of God are there for each other. And the last part is the purpose of God is accomplished. That's why the house of the Lord is so important. Did you know we accomplish more together than we ever do by ourselves? Ecclesiastes says two are better than one because they have a good return for their work. First Corinthians, r- relating to the poem that was just read, says the body is a unit, though it is made up of many parts. And though all of its parts are many, they form one body. Now you are the body of Christ and each one of you is a part of it. We need each other. We accomplish more together than we would ever do by ourselves. And by the way, here's another part of that purpose of God that accomplish. There is spiritual power in numbers. What do you mean by that, Pastor Greg? Let me read a scripture and I'll explain it to you. Matthew chapter 18, verse 20 says this. For where two or three come together in my name, there am I with them. Let me give you a little background of that. We always talk about that when we meet together, like, oh, God shows up in a special way. But there's, a, there's so much more to that scripture than what we understand. When we declare, see, it's talking about witnesses agreeing on something in the church. And then it says when they agree on those things, there am I in the midst of them. It's almost like this. When there is unity, there, it's like God shows up in a special way. When we declare things together in unity, there is power in the spiritual realm. It's like things are established and God says, okay, then I'm going to show up because you agreed and you stood upon what I had for you. Those strongholds become broken. Those decla- de- there's decle- decrees and declare declarations, those are like, like, how do you describe it? They're missiles in the spiritual realm that God sends out. There is power when we get together in a group of people in agreement and unity and in spiritual authority that God says, when you do that, there am I in the midst of it. It's like he shows up in a special way. There is spiritual power in numbers when we show up. That's why it's important to come together in the house of the Lord as the people of God. Accomplishing the purpose of God. Let me talk about the next one. The church witness. The church witnesses to the world. That's part of the thing that takes place as we accomplish. What do I mean by that? Well, the scripture says many times, and I've got a couple verses listed there. By all men will know that you are my disciples. How? If you love one another. You know how we witness to the world? Through our unity, through our love for one another. But you guys come from all different backgrounds and different church backgrounds and no church backgrounds. And you come from growing up in this place and growing up in that place. And how do you guys get along so well? How do you love one another? Well, the truth is sometimes we do good and sometimes we don't. But when we get along well, when we love each other well, people notice there's something different. We witness to the world. The church witnesses to the world as we meet together. Another one is this. Here's another thing accomplished. The gospel expands to other regions because of a local church that supports one another, that supports ministries. If you look in the book of Philippians, you find out that the apostle Paul was traveling all over doing missionary work, and he had this special church in Philippi. And what did they do? They supported him wherever he went. They prayed for him. They gave him finances. Here's the thing about this. Did you know that the Assemblies of God, one of the main reasons the denomination of the Assemblies of God was started was so that they could send missionaries around the world because they recognized this one thing. We can do more together than we can separate. And so they said, let's become a fellowship of churches And let's begin to send missionaries into the mission field. Which leads to my next point. Well, that's the next next point. I'll skip to that one and then I'll come back. We are privileged to send out people into the mission field. That's part of the accomplishments of God. If you look in the book of Acts, it said, Paul and Barnabas were ready to go out in the mission field and they laid hands on them and they sent them out. We as churches, we as local bodies unite together and we accomplish the work around the world 
by uniting together and meeting. The gospel expands to other regions. By the way, this is kind of a side note with all of this, but it's on your notes here, and I think it's important to recognize this. Investing in the kingdom of God gives you eternal rewards. Here's the thing. If you put money in the stock market right now or in a bank, you might get a return. You might not. I don't know. Some of the investments right now are going backwards. Some are barely holding up. But here's the thing. If you invest in eternal things, you get eternal rewards. I I don't know how to quantify this, but I can tell you this from my experience. The churches that give to missions, when they send missionaries, whether it be next door or whether it be around the world, those churches thrive. Those churches make it financially. Those churches are blessed by God because they are investing in eternity. I was a part of a church that had very little people going to it, but they gave to missions, and I still to this day don't know how we made it financially other than we gave to missions and God blessed the church. When you invest in eternity, the rewards are out of this world. People come into the kingdom of God, and God is blessed. And that happens through the house of the Lord. So question for you, and I'm almost done. What are some ways that the purpose of God has been accomplished through this church that we could have not done by ourselves? Can you think of things in the history of this church or things that has been accomplished in this community or around the world as a result of this church, this house of the Lord? Pumpkin patch? local thing. Just thinking about that. I'm looking over here at a guy that went on some missions trips and started an organization. They were sending pairs of uh, shoes around the world that started out of this church. Some of you know that, Provision International. Would you agree that we can accomplish more together than by ourselves? We accomplish the the work of God, not just even here, but all around the world. Through this house of the Lord. Yes. Mm -hmm. The lives that have poured into young people for years. The purpose of God can be accomplished through this church. And sometimes God sends people to help us do those things. So I want to show a video now of what happened this last summer, which was an answer to prayer. And the Pebble Creek Church came, and they partnered with a bunch of us here, and they were able to impact the community. So let's watch the video. It's kind of fun a little bit here and see what kind of things that took place. Uh, There might be volume on that. There you go.
this is just one example of partnering with others to make an impact for the kingdom of God. There was water baptisms. There was people who were in need that had their houses fixed. There was a vacation Bible school. There was, there was projects done. What does it all come down to? Let me read that first scripture again that I started with. Psalm 122.1, I rejoiced with those who said to me, let us go to the house of the Lord. We're thankful to God for the special times where his presence has shown up here. We're thankful for the family of God, brothers and sisters in Christ that can help us go through difficult times and for the purposes of God that are accomplished. Many of these things cannot happen to the extent without us meeting together in the house of the Lord. God is bigger than one building, but there's something special about meeting together. These things can't be done through a television preacher. They can't be done by ourselves or through worshiping God in nature. We have to get together. We need each other. We need to meet together. That's why the encouragement I understand it's, you know, it's easy to have church at home. It's easy to watch a preacher that can probably preach a lot better than I can because they are gifted in ways that I'm not. But there is something special about joining others in the house of the Lord here and hearing testimonies and hearing what God's doing and worshiping together because we were not meant to be alone. We were not meant to have online church for more than a season. <laughs> Isolation, we can't continue to thrive in our Christian walk if we are isolated. And I can tell you this, it seems to me that when I pray over somebody in person, my prayers seem to be more powerful. I don't know what it is about God showing up, but there's something special. God wants us in regular relationship with other believers. When without a place to do that, it is much more difficult. And to be honest, Without a place to meet, most people don't meet. We just don't. So why do we have the fall back to church Sunday? Because we want to encourage you, your friends, your neighbors, people who, who need to be in a body, who need to be in the house of the Lord to realize what they're missing and to come back and say, we miss you, we want you here, it's important for you to be here. Psalm 92, verses 12 through 15, and then I'm going to pray. It says this, The righteous will flourish like a palm tree. They will grow like a cedar of Lebanon. Planted in the house of the Lord, they will flourish in the courts of our God. They will still bear fruit in old age. They will stay fresh and green, proclaiming the Lord is upright. He is my rock, and there is no wickedness in him. What does that just mean? It says, the righteous will flourish when they are planted in the house of the Lord. This is the house of the Lord that God has called me to. And this is the house that God calls so many to. We flourish when we plant ourselves here. We need to be planted in the house of the Lord. The local church and we celebrate the local church today we celebrate the people that lift us up we celebrate the presence of god that shows up here and we celebrate the purposes of god that are accomplished through this place we need the local church we need harlotin faith chapel we need to meet together would you bow your heads with me this morning heavenly father i thank you for the vision for this church that happened years ago in the late 70s, people wanted a place to meet together. And it became a reality. And here we are, decades later, still reaping the rewards from those people's vision. And we have seen many great things, even in the time I've been here, but even before that of your presence here, of the people helping one another and the purposes of God accomplished. But God, I pray this morning for this church. You're not done with it yet. You have great plans. I pray that you would bring people back into the house of the Lord. Let me ask you, if you're here today,
and you are not a part of the family of God. And the Lord is, you feel like God is, is tapping you on the shoulder or, or tapping you in your heart and saying, see what you're missing by not being a part of the house of the Lord? Your first step is you need to become a part of the family of God. If you are here today and you've never really made that decision that says, I want to be a follower of Jesus, I want to be a part of the family of God, then pastor, I want you to pray for me because that's what I want today. If that's you here today, I want you to raise your hand and say, Pastor, pray for me. I want to be a part of the family of God. I'm really not a part of that today. Would you pray for me? I also want to do this. I want us to believe that everyone who is a part of the family of God here is going to invest in regularly becoming a coming back to the house of the Lord, this local church. If you're here today and you say, God, I've been a little lax. I know it's important for me to be here. I just commit myself to you now with courage and strength because I need these people. I need you. And I want to see great things accomplished. And God, today I commit myself to doing that to coming into the house of the Lord. If that's you here today, just say to yourself and to God, say, God, that's me. I'm going to commit myself to being more regular a part of the house of the Lord here in Harleton Hills Chapel. Amen. Would you, would you look up at me for a minute? We had all kinds of great things planned with Trinity coming here. But apparently God has other plans. He wants us to re re know how much we're needed in the house of the Lord. Here's how I'm going to close today. I want you to find a few people near you. I don't care how small or big. And I want us to be there for each other for a minute. If I want us to take make little prayer groups. And I want us to pray for one another because we need each other. You might not have anything you need prayer for. And by the way, prayer is just talking to God. If somebody says, hey, I've got an owie on my toe, just say, hey, God, they got an owie on their toe. Would you help them? That's really all it takes. But I want you to find two or three or four or five or six and just say, you know what? Let's just take about two, three minutes, not long. You can take more if you want. And let's pray for one another because we don't get that at home. We can only get that together. We can only lift one another up in a special way when we're together. So, assignment is turn your chair around, move a little bit. You can walk across. Just find two or three or four or five and say, would you pray with me? Or, hey, let's just, let's just talk together. And it doesn't have to be long. It can be a really quick prayer. Say, this is something you can pray for in my family, in my life, my friends, my kids, my whatever. Let's just close by being the family of God and lifting one another up. Okay? That's it. And then when you're done, head downstairs for the potluck meal, and we'll eat. Okay?